Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we will be investigating how the ancient Egyptians represented used fractions, and we'll also look at some of the other mathematics that they did. So natural numbers are the most basic numbers, and natural number arithmetic shows up in all ancient cultures that left a record. But fractions also arise from many practical problems, and ancient cultures had different ways of working with them. The ancient Egyptians had an interesting way of representing and working with fractional quantities. They only used unit fractions, that is, fractions with a numerator of one. They had one exception. They did use the fraction two-thirds, which had a special symbol that you can see here. For fractions, they had a bar-like symbol they placed over their hieroglyphs, or, or hieratic symbols for natural numbers to represent unit fractions. So, for example, here are the hieroglyphic representations for one-half symbol with the denominator of two, a fraction, unit fraction with the denominator of three, one-third. Here's for one-fourth, and here's for one-tenth. Remember, that's a symbol for ten. Today, we use fractions with any natural number, numerator, or denominator. For example, we might say 4 sevenths to indicate that we have a whole divided into seven equal parts, and then we are considering four of them. Notice that this is essentially a shorthand for 1 seventh plus 1 seventh plus 1 seventh plus 1 seventh, which equals 4 sevenths. Egyptians only used unit fractions and two thirds. Using only these fractions is similar to only using certain types of coins. When we make change for money, such as 37 cents, we don't usually break it down into the 37 pennies. Instead, we use as many of the largest value coins that we can. We would probably give that as a quarter, a dime, and two pennies. In a similar manner, the Egyptians expressed all fractions as sums of unit fractions. Okay, so for example, to represent what we would call four sevenths, <clears throat> they would see that four sevenths is less than a half, but greater than a third. So the representation would start with one, uh, one third. After removing one third, the next highest unit fraction that would be less than the remaining amount is one sixth. After removing the one sixth, the remaining amount is one fourteenth. So ultimately they would see that four sevenths and of course, they wouldn't think of that as four sevenths. They would just think of it as taking four things and dividing into seven equal pieces. And what do you get? You get one third plus one sixth plus one fourth. So the Egyptians would say, uh, basically, if you had four uh, whole things and you would divide it equally among seven uh, groups, for example, four loaves of bread and divided equally into by seven people, each person would get one third of a loaf, a sixth of a loaf, and a fourteenth of a loaf. Some sophisticated mathematics was actually involved in working with these unit fractions in the Egyptian system. In fact, probably some of their most sophisticated mat uh, mathematics was dealing with fractions. And we have surviving some mathematical computational tables with Egyptian fractions. So what would happen is maybe a scribe was likely to have a table giving a breakdown of many of the smaller and uh, more common quotients of natural numbers resulting in proper fractions given as sums of unit fractions. In other words, there'd be a unit fraction for um, you know, uh, three divided by four, and and uh, and uh, four divided by five, and four divided by seven, and eight divided by nine, and so forth. They would there would be expressions of those. So, for example, here we saw that four sevenths was essentially was this, you know, one third plus one sixth plus one fourteenth. 
this would all be worked out ahead of time in a table. And so someone wanting to know what 4, 7, 4 divided by 7 was would just look it up in a table rather than having to do the calculation themselves. So that was a big time saver. A lot of work went into making those tables. So this is similar to how we used to use um, tables for trigonometric functions, logarithms, and statistical functions, and others before the advent of calculators. Of course, today we just pull out a calculator and uh, the algorithms that are built into the calculator will compute these things for us. Egyptian scholars were able to perform other fractional arithmetic problems, including adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing fractions, and of course applying those to real world uh, problem solving. We've already seen that ancient Egyptians could represent and perform arithmetic with natural numbers and fractions. They were also able to solve a variety of practical problems, including the equivalent of solving linear equations, solving certain types of quadratic equations, at least one type, uh, solving proportion problems, finding areas of things such as rectangles and triangles and trapezoids. They approximated the area of a circle with a formula that looks like area equals Diameter minus diameter divided by 9 uh, squared. So essentially, notice you can factor this out. Uh, this works out to be uh, basically our modern formula if pi were 256 over 81, which is approximately 3.16049, not a little bigger than than pi actually is, but not a not terribly bad uh, approximation. Um, and they could also find the volumes of some simple 3D shapes, definitely uh, including pyramids, which they were definitely interested in building. So they also focus mainly on practical applications. One of the types of problems that they solved a lot was surveying so a lot of their geometry type problems were dealing with surveying one of the reasons why that was important is the nile river uh, which is the major river through through egypt and in their major part of their of their livelihood it flooded pretty much every year and then then when it receded it changed the the layout of the land and so they need to be able to survey um, they did. They used mathematics and commerce. They also had a, in spite of the fact they had a, a geocentric model of the universe, the Earth in the center, uh, they were able to, to work out the mathematics for s some astronomical things, including they were able to compute an accurate calendar of 12 months of 30 days and then five extra days uh, being you know, extremely close to correct. Okay, 365 day calendar, pretty much what we use today. Uh, they also had a 24 hour day like we do today. Here's a problem for the Moscow papyrus. Find the number such that if it is taken one and a half times, then four is added, the sum is 10. Now notice how they probably said this. This is probably not written in kind of uh, today's symbols. There was no no real multiplication symbol, no no uh, no equals, no certainly no variables. Uh, but this really is uh, an equation, okay? And here's the solution they gave. It re translates something like this: calculate the excess of 10 over 4. The result is 6. You operate on a half to find one, the result is two thirds. You take two thirds of six, the result is four. Behold, four says it. You will find that this is correct. So try uh, writing this out as uh, a modern algebraic equation and solve it. And if you do, you're gonna find that the solution you use use exactly the same steps uh, as this. So here's a question, is this algebra? Were the uh, ancient Babylonians doing algebra you know, 
many centuries ago? Well, the answer kind of depends on your definition of an algebra. Is algebra or any other mathematics a set of rules, algorithms, or is it the axiomatic foundation upon which those rules are built? Does it require a, a, a variables? Does it require equations? Does it require any kind of notation? So depending on your answer, we, you may say yes or no. Uh, this particular process uses basically the same basic algorithm as today's algebra. So if you think it's just an algorithm, then yeah, perhaps they were doing algebra back then. But it definitely was not written symbolically, and it was not proved or built on an axiomatic foundation. So certainly this is a uh, precursor of algebra, perhaps. It is solving an equation of types, even though they wouldn't have thought of it as an equation. Um, but maybe it's not completely algebra. I don't know. It depends on your definition. They also sometimes solved, uh, essentially solved equations by a method called false position. And let me give you an example of how that works. Um, suppose, again, they wouldn't have written it this way, uh, but if you solve an equation a plus 1 ninth times a equals 20, what is, the, what is a? You know, okay, so they probably would have said this something much differently, like take a quantity and and uh, add to it one ninth of that quantity and the result is 20, what is the quantity? So they would have said it in words like that. So in fact, this idea of, of writing equations with symbols and variables, this is a much later result. So the way, the way this uh, method of false position goes, it's sort of a guess, check, and, and adjust method. So you guess an answer and see what happens. So guess an answer like A equals 9. 9 is definitely not the right answer. Uh, 9 was picked here just to make the, answer, the arithmetic turn out more easily. But if you plug in a 9, let's see, 1 ninth of 9 is 1, and 9 plus that is 10. Well, 10 is not the same as 20, so we got it wrong. But now what you do is you uh, adjust. So 20 is twice 10, right? And so you adjust the, 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 the uh, 9 proportionally, multiply it by 2 as well as 8 to get 18, and it turns out 18 is the correct answer. And the reason this works in this one is, is this equation is actually a proportion. This is just a constant times a equals another constant. 10 ninths a equals 20. So since this is proportional, um, the, uh, those results will be proportional as well. Okay, so we're going to move on to some Mesopotamian Babylonian mathematics in the uh, next video.